Good evening. I'm Roy Scranton. Uh, I'm an associate professor of English and creative writing, um, and also director of the Creative Writing Program, uh, as well as the Notre Dame Environmental Humanities Initiative. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'll have some uh, remarks to make um, and some welcoming to do on my part. But first, before that, uh, I want to invite uh, Father John Jenkins, uh, president of the university, to the stage uh, to welcome you to the event. Reverend John Jenkins, uh, CSC, has served as the University of Notre Dame's 17th president since 2005. As president, he has devoted himself to fostering the university's unique place in academia, the church, our nation, and the world. Father Jenkins has uh, been committed to combining teaching and research excellence with a cultivation of the deeper purposes of Catholic higher education. While pursuing academic distinction, he has brought renewed emphasis to Notre Dame's distinctive mission, rooted in the tradition of the Congregation of Holy Cross, the university's founding community, to educate the whole person, mind, body, and spirit, to do good in the world. Within the university and beyond, Father Jenkins has called for civil discourse, grounded in the Christian view of others as equally made in the image of God as a way to find common ground. A philosopher trained in theology and a member of Notre Dame's Department of Philosophy since 1990, Father Jenkins earned undergraduate and advanced degrees from Notre Dame, a doctorate of philosophy from Oxford University, and a master of divinity and licentiate in sacred theology from the Jesuit School of Theology. Uh, please uh, welcome to the stage, Father Jenkins. Thank you, Roy, and thanks everyone for being here tonight for this uh, important discussion. Uh, tonight's events, Aftermaths, the Invasion of Iraq and Historical Perspective, is the first in a series of two conversations about the Iraq War, with the second discussion taking place here in this venue at, tomorrow at noon. These events are our final keynote events for this year's Notre Dame Forum on War and Peace. Since we established the Notre Dame Forum in 2005, each year we have invited a campus-wide dialogue about an issue of importance to the university, the nation, and the world. This year's forum discussion has been robust, multifaceted, and we hope thought-provoking. In the fall, the campus community gathered in the Notre Dame Stadium to hear Emmy Award-winning actors and visiting students from Ukrainian Catholic University deliver a dramatic reading of an excerpt excerpt from the ancient Greek tragedy, Aeschylus's The Suppliants, which became the springboard for conversations about the impact of war in modern times and in so many parts of the world. And our consideration of these themes during the spring semester continued with, among other events, sponsored by departments across campus, a powerful film series, a prayer service on the one-year anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, and a lecture by Cardinal Robert McElroy on the just war doctrine in the Catholic tradition, the power of nonviolent resistance and the primacy of individual conscience. We gather this evening and tomorrow to reflect on the war in Iraq as our nation marks the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion. The invasion in 2003 marked the second time the U.S. fought a war in that country in a little more than a decade. As we know, at the start of an eight-year conflict that resulted in the deaths of thousands of U.S. service members and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, as well as the displacement of millions. The consequence of the evasion and, its, and the occupation continue to reverberate today in Iraq, in our nation, and across the globe. And we are honored to be joined tonight and tomorrow by expert journalists, historians, and writers from around the world to help us examine the aftermaths of the, of the U.S. invasion of Iraq I will now turn the floor back to, to Roy uh, and uh, have him um, begin uh, tonight's program. Roy. Again, I want to welcome everyone here tonight. 20 years ago, the United States invaded the sovereign nation of Iraq. The invasion was illegal in the terms set uh, by the United Nations Charter and justified by a government campaign of misinformation and lies. Promises of swift victory and claims of mission accomplished were soon proved false as the rapid collapse of the Iraqi military and Saddam Hussein's regime gave way to a bloody eight-year occupation. 
Thousands of, Iraq, of American soldiers were killed and hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians, men, women, and children. Millions more were displaced internally or fled abroad. The devastation within Iraq to its civil society, its social fabric, its ecology, its culture, its people's hopes cannot be quantified. As the work of our guest Omar Dawachi shows, displacement, war injury, trauma, and loss cannot be separated out, nor can we easily disentangle the past from the present. Indeed, the disastrous consequences of the 2003 US invasion and occupation of Iraq are with us today and continue to cause their own complex effects. Some of those consequences include the rise of ISIS and subsequent civil war in Iraq from 2014 to 2017, which killed more than 67,000 civilians and displaced more than 5 million people. Persistent chronic civil and regional instability, including the Syrian civil war, increased religious extremism and chronic economic and social chaos. These consequences are not limited to the Middle East, but ripple out across the world, for instance, in the 2015 Mediterranean migrant crisis. Here in the United States, the moral costs of such a war are difficult to reckon. It is all too easy to forget that this was an aggressive war and that it was based on lies. It is all too easy to forget that the US military and intelligence community adopted torture as standard operating procedure, including waterboarding, sexual humiliation, and physical beatings. It is all too easy to forget that most Americans were in favor of the war before it began and supported it after it started, despite a lively protest movement, at least until uh, for a few years until it uh, became apparent to everyone that things had spiraled out of control. It was supposed to be a quick war. It was supposed to be an easy war. It was supposed to be a good war. It was supposed to be a just war. It was none of these things. As our guests, Spencer Ackerman and Andrew Basevich argue each in their different ways, the Iraq war and the broader war on terror have had profoundly corrupting effects on American civic and political life. Indeed, sometimes the cost is even more direct. Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs estimates that more than 30,000 active duty personnel and veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have taken their lives over the last 20 years. The cost of war cannot be measured in the number of bodies it produces. The moral reckoning we are obliged to undertake, which we have never yet undertaken as a nation, demands a deep look inward to our mistakes and a courageous look outward to recognize those we've harmed and hear their demands for reconciliation and repair. We've come here tonight and we'll meet again tomorrow in order to create a space for such reckoning. Of course, no single event could do justice to such a demand, to such a history. And even worse, we do not have the comfort of looking back in a time of peace. War, quipped Mark Twain, is God's way of teaching Americans geography. We learned about Fallujah and Baghdad and Basra and Mosul. We've recently learned about Kiev, Mariupol, Kherson, and Bakhmut. And our teachers are preparing new lessons on the Straits of Taiwan and the South China Sea. Regrettably, God has yet to find a way to teach Americans history. No, we won't be able to address all that tonight or tomorrow. What I do hope is that by bringing together a few people with interest and knowledge on the topic, both professional and personal, we may create, amidst war and alarms of war, a space to remember those who have died and suffered, to reflect on what we may have learned or perhaps remember what we may have forgotten, and to come together from our different histories and perspectives and woundings to cultivate a moment of peace, if a peace without rest Peace and, one hopes, perhaps wisdom. I'm grateful to Father Jenkins for his support for this event, as well as to the 2022-2023 Notre Dame Forum Advisory Committee. I'm grateful to the staff in the President's Office who did all the heavy lifting, including Ann Firth, Kara Mullaney, uh, Hannah Heinsecker, and especially Heather Asiala, who has been on point and ahead of the curve at every step. And I'm also grateful to everyone else involved from the staff serving food to our guest panelists, um, to ND Studios, who's live streaming the event, and to all of you who came here tonight. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce our guests, but before doing so, I want to remind you that first, there will be a reception uh, following tonight's event, where we will be able to continue the conversation. Second, uh, the conversation continues tomorrow morning with an interfaith discussion on Abrahamic voices in the aftermaths, hosted by the Ansari Institute from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m., featuring Mahan Mirza, Charles Powell, and Rabbi Karen Kompanez. And tomorrow at noon, we have the second Aftermaths event, Aftermaths 2, The Invasion of Iraq in the Present, which will feature a literary reading and discussion with Iraqi and Iranian authors and artists Salar Abdo, Amal al-Jaburi, Mortada Ghazar, and Dunya Mikhail. Uh, and that will be moderated by Atalia Omer. All events will take place here at the X Center, so there is no excuse uh, getting lost. Now, for our panelists, uh, they're, they're all going to, they're just going to talk for a few moments and then um, our moderator will uh, open up conversation with them and then, and then a more broader conversation as well. Spencer Ackerman, uh, so I'm going uh, right to left, um, skipping our moderator, returning to her. So Spencer Ackerman uh, has been a national security correspondent for outlets like the New Republic, Wired, The Guardian, and The Daily Beast for nearly the entire war on terror. He's reported from the front lines of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo Bay, and shared in the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service Journalism for Edward Snowden's NSA leaks to The Guardian, a series of stories that also yielded him other awards, including the Scripps Howard Foundation's 2014 Roy W. Howard Award for Public Service Reporting and the 2013 IRE Medal for Investigative Reporting. Ackerman's Wired series on Islamophobic counterterrorism training at the FBI won the 2012 Online National Magazine Award for Reporting. And his 2021 book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced Trump, won an, won an American Book Award. He publishes the Forever Wars newsletter, is a columnist for the nation, and lives in his native Brooklyn with his wife and children. Andrew Basevich Jr. is an American historian specializing in international relations, security studies, American foreign policy, and American diplomatic and military history. He's a professor emeritus of international relations and history at the Boston University Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies and a retired career officer in the armor branch of the United States Army, retiring at the rank of colonel. He's a former director of Boston University's Center for International Relations from 1998 to 2005 and co-founder and president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. His most recent book is After the Apocalypse, America's Role in a World Transformed. Omar Dawachi is an associate professor of medical anthropology and global health at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Before he joined Rutgers in 2018, Dewachi co-founded the Conflict Medicine Program at the American University of Beirut, where he taught social medicine and global health. Dewachi holds an MD from Baghdad University, an MPH from the American University of Beirut, and a PhD in anthropology from Harvard, and is the author of numerous publications in medical, anthropological, and global health journals, including The Lancet. His book, Ungovernable Life, Mandatory Medicine and Statecraft in Iraq, winner of the Society for Medical Anthropology's 2019 New Millennium Book Award, documents the untold history of the rise and fall of Iraq's healthcare system under decades of US-led intervention. Dawachi's ongoing project, When Wounds Travel, weaves almost two decades of ethnographic research with his personal experience of displacement and his medical and public health practice across Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria, to document the trajectories and ecologies of war injury, trauma, and loss, and the reconfigurations of healthcare and humanitarian geographies across the Middle East. Finally, our moderator, Rosemary A. Uh, Kalanick, Kalanick, sorry, Kalanick. Kalanick, is an assistant professor of political science here at the University of Notre Dame, where her research focuses on international security, course of diplomacy, energy politics, and US grand strategy. She's the author of Black Gold and Blackmail, Oil and Great Power Politics, Cornell University Press, 2020, which explains why great powers adopt radically different strategies to secure oil access in case of emergency or war, and Crude Strategy, Rethinking the U.S. Military Commitment to Defend Persian Gulf Oil, co-edited with Charles Glazer. Finally, I want to note that Jane Araf, New York Times Baghdad Bureau Chief and former CNN Baghdad Bureau reporter who covered the war, was scheduled to participate in this discussion but due to personal circumstances, had to withdraw at the last minute. We're honored and delighted to have all of our guests here, but I was especially excited to see Jane, whom I met when I was reporting a story for Rolling Stone 
in Baghdad in 2014 and who came to my rescue in an awkward disagreement I had with the U.S. ambassador. But maybe that's a story for the reception. For now, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. Uh, I believe that first up is Spencer Ackerman, who's going to uh, give us his remarks and thoughts about the war. Uh, well, thank you so much for all of you for attending uh, to Rose, to Roy, to Father John. Um, I'm a reporter, so I'm going to start out telling a story about crab legs. Um, Alaskan king crab legs uh, were not on uh, my household dinner table growing up uh, Jewish in Brooklyn. Um, and I encountered them for the first time in, of all places, Baghdad. It was March of 2007, the dawn of the troop surge, and I was coming back from a patrol with an army company of military police who were mentoring Iraqi police officers. At the time, Iraqi police officers at senior levels were nonchalantly packing their holding cells with frightened people and just as nonchalantly estimating how many of their cops were really sectarian militiamen in uniform. Mentorship involved U.S. companies giving them the material support necessary for such operations while telling them not to act like sectarian militias. I rode with the 57th Military Police Company back onto what was then called the Victory Base Complex, which those who experience it will remember is a massive fortified constellation of bases clustered around Baghdad International Airport. It was chow time, and to my amazement, topping the buffets were cutlass-length crab legs, and for dessert there were six flavors of ice cream. Every now and then during the war, a veteran or a reporter remarked about the creature comforts available on the giant forward operating bases. It was usually to refer to them and their denizens as pampered and spared the brutal realities of the war. But what we were actually experiencing was how profitable the Iraq war was. The real money was, of course, not in dining facility operations, but those operations were something of a microcosm. The Iraq war was financed on credit rather than direct taxation, and it was nothing to direct exorbitant public contracts to companies like Halliburton, which purely coincidentally was Vice President Dick Cheney's company, which among other things ran dining facility operations for the US military in Iraq. This was an era when the Pentagon leadership was seeking to prove that it could privatize as many aspects of its expansive global operations as it could. By 2004, Halliburton held $9 billion in contracts in Iraq, according to an email obtained by the Wall Street Journal, for just one month on one of the dozens of bases it serviced, Halliburton charged the Pentagon for an average of 42,000 meals per day while serving 14,000. The crab legs weren't the only conspicuous aspect of the dining facility. Americans walked in through one entrance. The contract labor force, usually known as third country nationals because they were imported laborers, as well as Iraqis who worked for the occupation forces as translators and so forth, entered through a different and more highly securitized entrance. This awkward reminder of the social hierarchy inflicted by a foreign occupier was unremarked upon. It made a kind of sense following the logic of occupation, under which every Iraqi is a potential threat and those who perform the wage labor of a privatized war are obligated to be invisible. Not even active service to the occupying forces performed at enormous personal risk from death to sexual assault to human trafficking to more mundane forms of exploitation could override these fundamental indignities of occupation. About 18 months later, as the US was negotiating a three-year troop basing agreement with its besieged client government, the State Department advised the government of Nouri al-Maliki to give no-bid oil field development contracts to ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, Chevron, and Total. It was a natural culmination of the Coalition Provisional Authority's September 2003 Order 39. That one is a lot less famous than the CPA's early orders, the ones that disbanded the Iraqi army and outlawed the Ba'ath Party, but it turns out to be more historically enduring. Order 39 privatized 200 Iraqi state companies, opened them up to foreign ownership, and permitted those foreign owners to move their profits entirely out of Iraq. Recently, we've been subjected to ceaseless anniversary journalism that treats the US invasion as complicated and unknowable, which helps veil the plunder of Iraq and makes the war seem like a worthy idea gone wrong, even one spoiled by those ungrateful Iraqis themselves. The New York Times ran a piece treating the war's origins as a great mystery, subject to never-ending academic debate, it conspicuously avoided referencing its library of articles on the news as well as the opinion side, laundering the Bush administration's deceitful rationales for war and deceitful depictions of the occupation. In fact, the Iraq war was a resource war. There are more, and less there are more or less sophisticated ways to say that, but I only have a brief moment, and that's the fundamental truth. 
No less than Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, remarked in his memoir, the Iraq war is largely about oil. And he was someone who advised President Bush to invade, to, as he put it, secure the global su supply of oil. President Trump would later say that the Iraq war he had supported was a stupid war because, among other reasons, the US didn't take the oil. In truth, Trump was operating on an outmoded concept of what taking the oil looks like. One of the many deceits of the war is that it was a noble sacrifice, an act of civilizational charity performed by the benevolent American hegemon on behalf of the Iraqi people, whom this perspective often cast as ungrateful savages. One of the Iraq war's neoconservative heralds, Fuad Ajami, dared to call his book The Foreigner's Gift. In fact, the Iraq war killed at least 200,000 people, and depending on which epidemiological model you credit, perhaps well upwards of a million Iraqis. Millions more were made into refugees. Enduring environmental despoilage, resulting from the US practice of incinerating its stuff in giant open air burn pits, is now a feature of the Iraqi landscape. In January, Iraq's planning ministry reported that fully a quarter of Iraqis live in poverty. The political, economic, and security structures the Americans created exacerbated Iraq's social divisions to the point where Iraq waged a civil war under occupation. The US typically blamed Iraqis and not themselves for unleashing these nightmares, even as it surveilled Iraqis, herded them through checkpoints, raided their homes and their holy places, locked them into det detention camps and torture prisons, and killed them with what can only be called impunity. I witnessed a spectrum of human behavior in Iraq from US troops toward Iraqis, from sincere compassion to seething disgust. Try as some sincerely did, there is no way to make occupation other than what it is, whether in Iraq, Ukraine, or Palestine, occupation is terror itself. There were no appreciable consequences for any of the architects and beneficiaries of the Iraq war. Its advocates in the policymaking and journalistic classes are presently busy using the Ukrainian flag to wipe the blood off their hands. That's when they're not pressing for a cold war with China, and maybe these things are related. But there is a way for the United States to show, not tell, but show, that it accepts responsibility for what it inflicted upon Iraq, to pay Iraqis reparations for their suffering, and to relinquish its self-appointed claim to police the world under the rubric of a so-called rules-based international order meant to bind everyone but Washington. The fact that reparation is politically unthinkable testifies to how deeply the imperial mentality infects the American consciousness. It can express regret, but it cannot make material amends. But the Iraq war had real winners, and among them were the oil companies and the military industrial complex that benefited from the consistent increases in US defense spending that have characterized the past 20 years. They ought to be able to fit the bill for a program of Iraqi reparations. Thank you. Spencer, thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna turn to Andrew Basevich. So I am Andrew Basevich, and uh, <clears throat> I'm really grateful to be here, grateful for the Notre Dame hospitality, grateful to Roy. Uh, we met at Berkeley at a meeting of veterans against the war, whatever it was, I just remember that. Uh, but I do wanna protest a little bit. Nobody told me I was gonna follow Spencer Ackerman. Uh, who is a f fabulous journalist and obviously an excellent storyteller. I'm not a journalist and I'm not a storyteller. So you're going to have to settle with what I got. Uh, I was at one time a historian. Now I'm 75 years old, so I'm too old to do any serious uh, research any longer. So I just occasionally pontificate. And the subject of pontification tonight is the, uh, the anniversary of the Iraq War. You know, our perspective, I say this as a former historian, our perspective on the past necessarily changes with the passage of time. And uh, my views about the Iraq War have never been particularly enthusiastic, but certainly have evolved in the couple of de decades since, uh, since we began the war. The Iraq War that the United States launched in 2003 was in fact, we've heard it from Roy, we've heard it from Spencer, was a disaster on many levels. What particularly strikes me 20 years on is the way that this needless war damaged our country. Not for a second, we've already heard some of the numbers, they're very important numbers. Not for a second would I want to diminish the human suffering among Iraqis and others in the region that resulted directly from the US invasion. 
nor am I ignoring the geopolitical consequences of U.S. recklessness, which continue to unfold in the region and more broadly. But I'm an American, so perhaps I can be forgiven for being especially attuned to how this debacle affected my country. Why did the United States embark upon this war of choice in the first place? There are many legitimate uh, answers to that question, but, but the one that strikes me 20 years on as encompassing the largest truth is this one. The United States invaded Iraq in order to reaffirm American global primacy, political, economic, and above all, ideological. With the end of the Cold War in 1989, the United States had ascended to the pinnacle of history. So at least American elites proclaimed. No plausible alternative existed to American style deliberal, liberal democracy. We had become, in Madeleine Albright's memorable phrase, the indispensable nation. And therefore, the future was ours. Ours to determine, ours to dictate. On September 11th, 2001, 19 hijackers, armed with nothing more than box cutters, cast a rather emphatic dissenting vote. The 9-11 attacks represented an abject failure of government to perform its most basic function, to defend the nation, to protect the people. Lurking behind that failure were large questions. Was the global triumph of American-style liberal democracy, in fact, foreordained? Was the United States history's indispensable nation? Or was it just possible that history was flirting with other possibilities? To put such questions to rest, the nation embarked upon a conceptually absurd global war on terrorism with a conventional invasion of Iraq, a nation with no involvement in 9-11, as its operational centerpiece. Here, ostensibly, was the means to affirm, to reaffirm, to demonstrate American omnipotence and primacy. Alas, as is so often the case in history, war proved to be an uncertain instrument. Washington's expectations of a quick, easy, and decisive victory were frustrated. To revive a term from another era, my era, <laughs> Iraq became a quagmire, which served in turn as a catalyst for the domestic crisis that presently envelops this nation. Here is the one sentence takeaway from my presentation. The Iraq War installed Donald Trump in the White House. Now, I personally don't think that Donald Trump as an individual is either very interesting or very important. But I do think that Trumpism is very important indeed. And by Trumpism, I mean the deep-seated sense of anger and alienation presently affecting tens of millions of Americans that Trump himself, of course, has rather skillfully nourished and exploited. Trumpism existed before Trump, and it will outlive Trump. But it was the Iraq War, in my judgment, that transformed Trumpism from a marginal phenomenon, so-called deplorables, griping about gun laws, the abandonment of traditional morality, and the loss of decent blue-collar jobs, that transformed that into something far more powerful. Americans today are engaged in a full-fledged culture war related to race and religion, gender and sexuality, family and education, our own history, and our nation's place in the world. In comparison with prior American wars, such as the Civil War, World War II, even Vietnam, Iraq really doesn't rank as all that big but its impact on American democracy has been massive. That's why the Iraq war matters. And I fear 
that we ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, now we move on to Omar Dwachi. Thank you. I won't be as eloquent as my uh, other colleagues, but I'll try to share some notes from my work and some reflections from my thought as someone who's lived through this war, lived through the other wars that the US has waged in Iraq. So um, when we talk about the 20th anniversary of the war, for many of us uh, Iraqis, it's very confusing. There are many anniversaries that, uh, of, of different kinds of wars that we live through. And uh, since the 1990s, at least, Iraq has been a subject of a biological experiment, uh, the legacies of which continues uh, to linger in Iraqi uh, bodies and their environment. This is, this is what I've been kind of mostly been doing research on what I call war biology, is this kind of understanding that nexus between militarism, um, bodies, and environment, and medicine. It, what, what I mean by also war biology is how this kind of wounding of war becomes registered uh, or inscribed in human and non-human life in Iraq. One of the central tragedies of, the, uh, of that history has been the collapse of Iraq's healthcare, during, especially during the 1990s. Uh, destruction of infrastructure, exodus of doctors, collapse of sanitation systems, and care projects. In many ways, in Iraq, the hospital, since the 1990s, have become a toxic place. I worked as a doctor in Iraq during the 1990s. And one of the major transformation that happened is how we, uh, as doctors, responded to the increasing ailments of, uh, uh, of patients and the increasing difficulties to treat very simple wounds. Wounds we had to uh, over, uh, overuse different kinds of antibiotics to at least save the lives of many of our patients. Little did we know that this uh, these changing practices across Iraq in different Iraqi hospitals will have legacies for the future. Health is the ability to recover from illness. This recovery in Iraq has become disabled um, during these sanctions years. And of course, uh, this is, can we, we can see that in, in the kind of the increasing numbers of maternal and child care, uh, infant deaths and maternal deaths malnutrition, uh, and all of that. In 2003, this assault on the, uh, on the Ira Iraqi bodies continued with no accountability from top to bottom. Instead, wounding became the language and currency of power with no accountability or accounting for these injuries or deaths. We are left with invisible accounts of these wounds. For many Iraqis, the wounds are not merely physical, but wounds uh, fester in the social body and the, in the body politic. It also fester in the broken healthcare system, uh, making people sick and setting in motion migration of millions of people across borders. Last month, I was visiting the city of Mosul, where actually my family was or is originally from. And over there, I did uh, research or kind of interviewed a lot of doctors. I, did, I went to, through different hospitals. And one of the really uh, major tragedies of the present day in Iraq is the rise of multi-drug multi resistant bacteria the, or antimicrobial resistance, which is basically a lot of injuries uh, take a long time to heal and actually a lot of antibiotics, a lot of uh, medications used to treat these patients are not working. For, uh, for many of, uh, of, the, of the patients there, uh, they had to struggle with, with, uh, with incre um, more amputations, more cleaning of these wounds, more flesh being removed from their own bodies. Um, Iraq currently leads the entire region with this major global problem of antimicrobial resistance. Um, and specifically, uh, what maybe people would know, MRSA, methicillin-resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. 
one of the one of the surgeons there explained to me that uh, in the open sewages where uh, a lot of remains of these wars and toxic legacies run a lot of these uh, multi, multi, multi drug resistant bacteria. So, when a patient has a tra uh, falls in one of these gutters after having an accident and having a wound that is open, it is 100 per almost 100% that that wound will be, uh, will be impossible to treat. So, so, and, and, the, and this problem has been kind of festering across the region, across different war zones. We've seen it in Gaza, we've seen it in Yemen, we've seen it in Libya, we've seen it uh, in Syria. And, and one of the things that I've been working on over the past decade is trying to understand how war drives this, this uh, uh, eco, ecological transformation uh, uh, in, in these different local ecosystems. So one of the hypotheses, hypotheses that we've been looking at is that one of the things that war does with the collapse of sanitation is creates this antibiotic anarchy. People begin to use antibiotics, doctors and people in general begin to use antibiotics in, 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 in very irrational ways. The second kind of hypothesis um, uh, involves contaminations in the environment, specifically heavy metal contamination from the ammunition, from the collapsed uh, uh, lived, inf uh, lived uh, structures. So to think about these legacies of the Iraq war is not necessarily a matter of history. Maybe the biology of this history needs to be seen as a horizon into the future of our planet. Indeed, the U.S. war machine has moved elsewhere. Meanwhile, old and new wounds continue to fester. Reports of Ukrainian and Russian soldiers infected with superbugs are all over the news. American soldiers carrying uh, uh, superbugs like what they called Iraqi bacter for anyone who's, who followed these stories of, of this bacteria that was picked up from Iraq moving back into the U.S. Other, uh, with, also with other chronic ailments and environmental exposures to, toxic, to all kinds of toxic materials. In many ways, as, as my colleagues were saying, ungovernability has returned home to hatch, and the war machine is eating itself up. For Iraqis, however, life goes on. Yet another chapter for, of a long history of cruelty, silence, and the lack of accountability. But the aftermath of the war, the destruction of a country and a society, and the wounding of bodies and environment will continue to haunt this country and probably this planet like a curse. Thank you. Omar, thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to, to pose a few questions to the panel, and anybody who would like to respond to them, please. You know, signal me. Um, I think the biggest question, or the most obvious question, perhaps, is how did this disaster happen? Right. Um, there are lots of reasons why we think that this shouldn't have happened. Right. Um, the United States is a democracy. There are theories in political science that democracies tend to be smart. Right. That democracies don't make mistakes. That um, checks and balances within democratic politics constrain the executive and prevent sort of misadventures and bad decision making, or at least should moderate that over time. Um, that uh, there's a marketplace of ideas, uh, you know, involved in functioning democracies where bad ideas should get sort of shouted down or ignored and good ideas should rise to the top. Um, I'm also mindful of the phrase that success has a thousand fathers and failure is an orphan. Right. Um, this is a, a war that, certainly looking back, and I believe it was noble at the time, um, was a disaster. Right. And yet it seems like when we're thinking about blame for the war and causes of the war, there are many potential fathers right, for this non-orphan uh, failure. Um, and so I'm wondering what, what you think about that. How do you think about how this war happened? Um, even though, in retrospect, it looks like such a huge mistake? Well, I gave one answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll add a asterisk, I suppose, to my answer. 
and that had to do with the evolution of American attitudes with regard to military power in the wake of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Most of us probably have forgotten or never knew that within the United States, within, within the national security apparatus, if somebody said to you, ah, how do we win the Cold War? I think a prominent answer was, well, the Soviets finally recognized that we were so far ahead militarily that they were never going to catch up. And they did the smart thing, they gave up. Let's also remember that, see, uh, fall of the Berlin Wall is uh, fall of 89. Saddam uh, invades Kuwait, August of uh, 1990. Uh, several months later, we've got the, uh, the Persian Gulf War of 1991. In other words, just moments after the Cold War ended, after the co end of the Cold War had raised up this notion of American military supremacy. And Operation Desert Storm seemed, I'll say it that way because it didn't, seemed to affirm the reality of American military supremacy. Remember that Saddam Hussein's army was advertised as the fourth biggest in the world. It was advertised as having become battle-hardened over the course of the Iran-Iraq War of 1980 to 1989. It was, in short, supposed to be a very formidable adversary, and it turned out not to be. But the conclusion wasn't, oh, I guess we overestimated the Iraqi army. The conclusion was, we are indeed omnipotent. And I think that this conviction, which was not simply shared in the military, I happened to be in the military at the time, but, but, but was widely shared among members of the political elite, uh, you know, in the New York Times and the Washington Post. I think that that helped to suspend critical faculties when we're fast forwarding to 2002, 2003. Why worry? We're gonna win. It's gonna be quick. It's gonna be cheap. And then of course the further assumption was that all kinds of other good things would result from that quick and easy victory. Utterly, completely, totally false, but in some respects I think the answer goes back to the, the perception of the military implications of the end of the Cold War. Spencer, go ahead. Um, very typically I think uh, Professor Basevich has, has made several uh, not just cogent points, but valuable contributions to the debate over this and the, our understanding of it, and I'm grateful to him for them. Um, I'd add a couple more. Um, to piggyback off uh, Professor's opening statement, 9-11 um, certainly, uh, the experience, and I speak as a New Yorker, uh, the psychological shock building off the sense of omnipotence and invulnerability uh, that uh, Professor Basevich rightfully identifies can't be understated and is hard to properly express to those who didn't live through it 20 years later. Uh, the deep fear and it's just as thorough exploitation um, by the Bush administration um, made these sorts of paranoid enthusiasms far more possible and also exposed to speak um, to Rose's point, um, how brittle after, you know, I, I would certainly date it from, you know, the both residue of, of four decades of Cold War and then uh, our, at that point, one decade experience of uh, unilateral global hegemony, uh, a true unipolar world, a true global superpower um, for, if not the first time in history, the first time in hundreds of hundreds of years, um, made these sorts of things so brittle that institutions that you would think of uh, to stop them didn't. Uh, journalism especially included. Uh, I can remember so vividly uh, how constrained the debate was inside newsrooms for the basic facts of how to refer to things for fear of creating a public backlash. Um, 
it took something like 15 years for the New York Times to refer to torture as torture after it became so um, impossible to argue uh, with the realities of what the United States did to people's bodies. And I would just also, you know, remember, you know, Iraq is a holdout in uh, unipolar hegemony um, and treated over the course of uh, a decade of the 1990s as this um, unacceptable bit of unfinished business. Um, and that created an atmosphere where, by degree, um, it was thoroughly uncontroversial, as Professor Dewey refers to, to starve and inflict mass suffering through economic measures that are not and cannot be targeted against malefactors, but affect an entire society. It is pure collective punishment. So many Iraqis who I have spoken to over the years, you know, in Iraq and then afterwards, keep trying to tell journalists and remind Americans that they don't consider the start date of the Iraq war to be 2003. They consider it to be the imposition of sanctions because they suffered. And I guess in addition to that, we have to remember from a base perspective, the democracy that exists in the United States is the most feeble and malnourished form of democracy possible. We have an oligarchic democracy. We live in a form of democracy layered on top of what we can only describe as a capitalist empire. The interests of that empire, the interests of capitalism, are to obtain control over critical resources. Those can be natural resources like energy. They can be manufactured resources like semiconductors and chips. And we're seeing that in a variety of different ways. Those interests together create combustible circumstances for uh, a kind of you know, typical American mix of material interest in exceptionalist fantasy. And those things together in this kind of perfect storm, I believe, produced the Iraq War. Um, not, not necessarily much to say about this, but. Um... But I think kind of one of the interesting things as, as someone who grew up in Iraq and, and lived through different kinds of wars, for, for many, my generation, war is always seen as a bad thing. Uh, at least, you know, we, we think about it as something really horrifying and horrible because we lived through it. But one of the things that I kind of was, was really uh, fascinated by when I came to this country is the fact that, that many kids and many uh, younger kids think that war is good for the economy. This is kind of that, that thing that gets inst in, instilled in, in the kind of the minds and the hearts of the, of the generation. So, so for me, that was something really fascinating to see and to compare how, how different ways people kind of understand th this relationship to war. Now, to kind of moving more uh, outwards to the more of the, the geopolitical, uh, I think I think towards the end of the uh, uh, of the 2000s, uh, I mean, actually towards the end of the 90s. Sorry, um, the sanctions on Iraq was beginning to 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 collapse by itself. Iraq was actually also beginning to make a lot of deals with the Soviet Union, with the with the with Russia, with China, and and uh, and with even with France. And and there was a kind of a big I think there was a lot of anxiety about what could happen if this uh, uh, one of the largest re reserves of oil, and I think Iraq necessarily produces a lot of oil, uh, but, but it's the second largest reserve of oil. So I think one of the interesting things that, at least for me, and, and made me think about the, the 2003 war, is that whoever controls that reserve, not necessarily produce it, not necessarily uh, uh, operate it, but actually just sits there over it. It controls kind of the future in many ways. Um, and I think that's kind of also one of the, the, uh, the main, re one of the central reasons. The other kind of uh, reason that I think uh, also kind of relates to a lot of the, these questions about, about wounding and wounds and is, is what do you do with this overproduction of military equipment? You know, you have to, you know, use it somewhere or send it somewhere else um, and, and I think kind of one of the, the most horrifying experiences of the past 
uh, decades is how weapons uh, started flowing into this region and became uh, the kind of the, the, the language of, of uh, settling uh, a lot of problems. Um, I think that's a really interesting point. And um, it makes me think just in general about how, how wars impact societies, both societies that are sort of the object of the war um, and societies that start wars, right? Um, and just thinking about, you know, you talk about the weapons sort of awash in the region. Um, there are weapons awash in the United States, right? A, a lot of the military hardware came back and is now being used by police forces, right? It's sort of one of many ways that the experience of war has affected American society in, in sort of surprising and unusual ways that you wouldn't sort of automatically put two and two together with. Um, and I guess I'm wondering in general what what you all see as the big effects sort of on American society, also on Iraqi society. Um, you know, within international politics, we often think of war as being transformative of societies. It can lead to an expansion of rights, right? Um, women get the vote. Or in Britain after World War II, you have the National Health Service, right? So there's these sort of positive things that you can get from war. Um, it can also disrupt societies like you have a giant draft and you know, thousands of people are conscripted. That did not happen in the United States. So um, I'm curious about sort of what you think about the ways in which war changed American society, but then also didn't change American society. Well, um, I wrote a book uh, that argues that uh, the war on terror is a major contributing factor uh, to the rise of Trump and to the general circumstances of American politics and society as they are. Um, Professor Bezovich made a version of this argument in his open remarks. So um, just to sort of riff on it a little, um, remember what uh, he was talking about, the way this war was sold, what Roy was talking about as well, about the way uh, this war was presented as a cost-free enterprise, that this was going to be an easy thing for such an overmighty military to uh, ultimately accomplish, particularly uh, one roused to anger uh, by 9-11, notwithstanding the irrelevance of, of, of Iraq to 9-11. And then it doesn't happen. This is the first time in, you know, for, for a lot of people, certainly, you know, it's, it's nowhere near the first time, you know, Vietnam is still present, but it's been kind of shunted to this uh, sort of marginal space, I think, in, um, you, you know, in both, U.S. politics, U.S. policy making, and certainly, and I can tell you as someone who reported from the Pentagon for years, um, absolutely marginal uh, to U.S. military uh, to U.S. military institutional memory planning um, and uh, understanding. Did of Viet Vietnam is Vietnam is yes, pardon me. Uh, and accordingly, Iraq becomes this experience where the war not only is neither quick nor is it uh, painful, but it's greeted with massive resistance from the people on whose territory it's been launched and has been described as a liberation. Very quickly, starting easily in 2004, you started seeing Americans blame the Iraqis for the failures of the Iraq war, not thinking back conceptually and uh, interpreting structurally what those reasons were, but instead treating the Iraqis as ungrateful. Frankly, like the description in the media was really disgusting, like truly treating Iraqis as, as something close to subhuman. And uh, the Iraq experience becomes this national humiliation that any demagogue is very easily uh, and naturally inclined to point to as how the war was betrayed by the people who wouldn't allow elites, so forth, who were not uh, sufficiently committed uh, to uh, the undertaking of this mission, which always, always, always means one thing, which is the infliction of massive social violence, even beyond what the war was, that there was always a kind of uh, level of violence that the United States could, could somehow unlock, and that would solve its problems uh, in Iraq, even as uh, the Iraq war has decisively refuted um, that perspective. When this feeling of national humiliation 
is so widespread, uh, especially in an environment of a global war on terror that is similarly bogged down and become uh, something that's gone from this uh, allegedly valorous exercise uh, to something that's more of an agonized experience, it's very easy for demagogues to point uh, to internal betrayals and say that only uh, under my leadership will it be possible to achieve uh, a, an American destiny without this sort of mistake. And that is a very live possibility in a country that doesn't want to look to what it did to Iraq and why. So one of the things that puzzles me, and it's a, I mean, it puzzles me, I don't, I don't pretend to understand it, is our collective capacity to remember selectively. So, you know, when I was young, my, the war I participated in was the Vietnam War. Divided the country in, in fundamental ways. A catastrophe in its own right. And one might have thought that when the war ended that, uh, well, lessons have been learned here that will never be forgotten. Well, the fall of Saigon was 1975, 1980. We elect Ronald Reagan president. And I think it was within six months he was declaring the Vietnam War an honorable cause and we were embarked upon uh, rearmament. It, it, Vietnam didn't matter. And something of the same thing strikes me with regard to Iraq slash Afghanistan and the global war on terrorism. Uh, Iraq was a disaster. The end of the Afghanistan war, as everybody says, longest in our history, was really humiliating, embarrassing. My God, how could, how could it have ended this way? And yet, it was when, within a year, I think, that we've got President Biden basically uh, re redefining history as a cosmic competition between democracy and authoritarianism and declaring that we're undecided democracy and, and you know, let's buckle up because we got to go take care of the Russians and the Chinese. And you sort of say, what happened to Afghanistan? What happened to Iraq? So genuinely, to me, it's a puzzle. Now, I think, I think part of the answer to the puzzle is World War II. Because World War II becomes this reference point, even for, I suppose, everybody in this room. But, well, almost everybody was born after the war happened. But none of it becomes this, this permanent reference point for America the liberator, you know, uh, uh, America the source of freedom. So yeah, we screwed up in Vietnam, and yeah, we screwed up in Iraq, but don't forget World War II, Spencer. We had some great times. Yeah. Uh, now, again, how, how, we, how we collectively, mentally uh, make this sort of the things that count and the things that don't count, to me, is a great mystery. But it's a relevant mystery to this conversation. Um, well, I think one, one way to think about it is you, you, a country like the US might have democracy or I mean, Iraq now has democracy. Uh, it's a big mess, um, like this country also. <laughs> um, I think one of them, but, but you could have democracy, but you can also be very much a bunch of idiots running, running uh, <laughs> politics. Um, one of the really most uh, horrifying things that happened uh, before the war is how the US administration brought in a bunch of um, exiled Iraqis to kind of allow these people to kind of help them go into the country. And these guys are advised. Um, many of these people uh, had kind of escaped Iraq a long time ago in the 80s. They actually were living on welfare and, 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 and scraps in Iran, in Syria, in, in the UK. Many of them were on welfare while also receiving money from the CIA. And that group of people was very, I mean, you know, just to kind of not to, like, to present a, a, the reality of what happened, that that group of exiles who came back to Iraq, many of them actually fought against the Iraqis uh, with Iran 
during the 1980s. And now, now those are the people who are in power in Iraq. Mm -hmm. these, uh, uh, these people were actually completely, um, uh, uh, they, they, they thought that they uh, had their rights taken from them. And they came back uh, with vengeance and uh, they created a lot of the, the, the kind of the early problems that we see because then, you know, they were whispering in the ears of Paul Bremer and others. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think there was, there was something, uh, Iraq has been kind of isolated for a really long time. You know, since the 1950s, very, very few Western, uh, let's say even sociologists have been able to to go there or write about society or understand what's going on. So most of the information uh, was, was, uh, was kind of being uh, understood and, and kind of uh, processed through uh, a discourse that has not, had nothing to do with reality. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of between the, the American hubris and ignorance and between the kind of the, the agenda of these uh, exiles uh, you you get a very uh, toxic combo, uh, so um, it's important kind of also to see that that history from from that point of view. Yeah, that's that's fascinating to hear about the the sort of ways in which the role of elites and sort of the masses um, played out in similar ways, sort of in Iraqi society and in American society. Right? Um, I mean, I think they there's found a each other. <laughs> they did, right? They did. They sort of got together and decided to, to do this thing, and then nobody really paid for it, right? I mean, Bush got reelected, right? Um, we haven't seen, you know, several of your comments um, across the panel sort of talked about the lack of accountability in general for the war. Um, and I think that's really, really interesting and really um, sort of thought provoking this idea that, um, that there's this huge disjuncture between elites and sort of reality, right? And certainly the rest of, of the people in a country. Um, you know, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, yeah. I think it's an excellent point. I think it's, it's a really central one to understanding the ongoing effects of the Iraq War. Um, during Vietnam, uh, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara had the kind of basic humanity to recognize that his entire life uh, was a fraud and a despicable disaster and retreated from public view. Didn't happen this time around. You had instead uh, the architects of the war proudly continue to deny that their works had been anything other than disaster and in some cases kind of preset them for institutional rehabilitation. Um, Paul Wolfowitz, became the president of, Paul Wolfowitz, for those who don't know, was one of the architects of the Iraq invasion. He was Donald Rumsfeld's deputy. He was uh, one of the uh, ideological forefathers of, of the war. And um, in, I think, what you know, every socialist will kind of nod their head and be like, that makes a lot of sense. They made him the head of the World Bank. <laughs> Condoleezza Rice, you know, Bush's national security advisor, um, you know, has, Yes, exactly. No, also, yes, an important figure in torture as well. Um, she, you know, she, whether it's Stanford's Hoover Institution um, or I think uh, she was on the Chevron board, something like that, you know, she gets invited to write op-eds about Ukraine. Whose advice would you rather take than an architect of the Iraq War? Um, well, why, Bush why, and Cheney why, himself. Why, why does, is that? Why, does this why is that? Why, why does, does this happen? happen? Why, I think why because does Tom Friedman still have yeah, a why column did, in the New York yeah. Times. Mm -hmm. I think the experience of Vietnam, as you pointed out very rightfully, the like the elite institution swallowed it and realized it could be cauterized off. And it's only five years, as you mentioned, between the fall of Saigon and Reagan, and another two before Granada. Um, I, as you know. I, I have been known to engage in some vulgar Marxism at times, so of course we also have to talk about like the economic, you know, material basis for the continuation of these events, but not in such a way that suggests a kind of grim inevitability about them. These are political choices that human beings make, and the institutions that shape them and that make them, and that they come to command, need 
this sort of both lack of accountability to continue their baseline operations in an engine of global domination and exploitation and extraction, and also to not feel as if they are the villains of history. And we are now witnessing uh, the absurd spectacle of uh, an effort, I believe a just one, you know, taking shape uh, to prosecute Russian war crimes charges at the International Criminal Court that the United States Pentagon uh, is opposing because it doesn't want to set a precedent. Remember, we are not a signatory to the International Criminal Court um, in order to make sure that no war crimes prosecutions ever come close uh, to touching an American uh, to the point where the previous administration put prosecutors on the ICC and their families under sanctions. That's why it keeps happening. Professor, perhaps Professor Bacevich uh, can either disagree well, no, with no, me or, I, or I, elaborate I, in a I, more I think, eloquent, I, sophisticated yes, no, way. I, I, I agree with that with regard to uh, the bureaucratic instinct to you know, protect itself and therefore to protect your own. But I don't understand why Max Boot still has a column in the Washington Post. I can tell you all I about media cowardice. Definitely I mean, there's Brett that. Brett Stevens published a column in the Times a week ago, 10 days ago, in which he said, yeah, I've got a couple things wrong, but I still think the Iraq war was uh, justified. I mean, how, how sitting around the editorial table at the Times, George Why doesn't Bush, somebody? George Bush teaches classes and in, 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 uh, master classes in leadership. Now. Well, he's he's got a school named after him too. I mean, so it's, I don't. It's just uh, even even you would think sort of the the atmospherics would be so repugnant that the people in charge would say, you know, we don't need Max Boot anymore, and let him go do something else. But that doesn't happen. Again, I don't understand it. That makes all of us, I think. I, I would just add finally that, you know, mass institutional complicity, uh, which happened over the Iraq War, which happened during the Cold War, which happened, you know, all throughout the war on terror and so forth, that makes for an unconducive environment um, for, you know, particular accountability moments. And it's usually when people get thrown under the bus, usually the low level people who commit the torture or who executed the individual and so on and so forth, and not the people who put them there to do it. Okay. Um, I think now is a good time for us to open up questions to the audience, because um, I could ask these gentlemen questions all day, but you're also here and, and you surely have questions. Um, we, oh. I want to take organizers' prerogative. Then. I think we have uh, microphones. That we do, have. yeah. Um, uh, if I'll you could, for yeah, yeah. For, for all of our streaming, uh, yeah. streaming folks. So I'll go up and do that. Okay, sure. Um, Yeah. So, um, so I'm I'm uh, I completely agree in denouncing uh, <laughs> um, all these people who uh, continue uh, to occupy these uh, high positions of of authority, um, ideological or otherwise, uh, who are architects of the war and continue to advocate for for war. But um, that seems like the it seems like an easier position to take than to ask the question which I want to pose to you all, is, is what would it mean to our conception of American democracy and the ruling elites if they are right from their point of view, if Iraq was a success to them? How, how would we make sense of that? Like if we take them at their word, Well, first of all, they're deluded. Uh, and, and, and the second thing I think would be that, you know, to make that argument, things went wrong, kind of, yeah, but still, it was a justified war. I'm glad we did it. I think that that's, that stems from a deep seated conviction that at the end of the day, America has a mission. And 
American power must be put toward the accomplishment of that mission, which is transformation of humanity and bringing everybody into alignment with, with our ever-changing values. And, and to begin to you know, abandon that claim, that is to say, to come to the conclusion that the Iraq War or the Vietnam War, you name it, was an unforgivable crime that fundamentally discredited this enterprise. Man, that's, I mean, their, their whole worldview at that point is shot, gone. They're left adrift, and that becomes unacceptable. I would add to that that, you know, a statement saying that, you know, the war was good if flawed in execution and so forth, and, uh, the way Roy put it, that's a killer saying that they intend to kill again. The point of that uh, conception is to say that ultimately the enterprise, the, the so-called mission, as, as, uh, as Professor Basevich put it, um, is necessary for the entire world because America is a pin and the world is a grenade. And that is uh, a prerogative of empire driven by its material basis um, that ultimately can't really coexist with what we think of as democracy. Uh, and we have to figure out how it is that we can take democracy back over one of the least democratic aspects of national decision making, which is uh, national security. Um, I think if you ask many Iraqis right now what, if the war was good or bad, you will have, will, you'll be even more confused. Some will tell you that, you know, that was the worst thing that could ha that happened. Some tell you that was the best thing that happened. Uh, depends on, you know, how much you benefited from that war, where you were before and where you are right now. But one of the, uh, for me, the, 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 one of the troubling aspects of that war is how this kind of call for war was epitomized in the figure of Saddam. How this one guy one person, if you take him out, then you are bringing democracy to the Middle East. Or if you take him out, you are you know, taking all the threats against America out of there. The, 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 the kind of this personification of evil in that character uh, became a, a, a way to simplify, a way to make these claims. Now people will say, well, you know, the world is better without Saddam. You know, the kind of the, the analogies to Hitler and to others. Um, it is incredible that with all the might of the US, they couldn't really just take that guy out with something else, you know, with a poison or with a, with a gun or, you know, rather there you had to like send an entire, go, go to war with an entire country, an entire society to, uh, to free them uh, from, from, this, uh, from this dictator. Um, that still boggles me, to be honest. And the same thing's going on now with Putin. Mm -hmm. Yes. And right around the corner with President Xi, you know, identifying the evildoer. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, can you wait for the microphone to make its way to you? Perfect. Thank you. I'm Mary Ellen O'Connell, um, a professor of international law here at Notre Dame and uh, a, a long time uh, conversation partner with Spencer and a uh, great admirer of all of your work on the panel. Um, I began my teaching career at Indiana University in uh, 1989 and uh, work on, in my specialties, the use of military force, the international law against it. So I have lived with the conflicts in Iraq since then and have just racked my brain for all these years about why the United States keeps getting itself into these terrible conflicts. And I, I've gone through the thinking that we've got short memories, that we're full of hubris, that all these, but now I'm really interested in preventing us from staying in this rut we're in and not starting the next conflict. And I don't know if we have so much to learn anymore from the past 
we can really analyze these things, but it doesn't seem to work to shift America. So I'm wondering how we get the United States back to believing in the international rule of law, which we wholesale rejected with the uh, uh, ascendance of Bill Clinton and our first armed conflict in which we did not even cite one bit of international law, and that was um, the use of military force against Serbia over Kosovo, 78 days of high aerial bombardment that killed 20,000 people. But this whole, the, the same time he was doing that, he was bombing Iraq, Iran, Iraq regularly throughout the Clinton administration. We didn't take any notice because they deserved it. So how do we start getting this country to comply with the same law we're holding, allegedly holding the Russians to? How do we shift that mindset? You, you said it, Spencer. We don't support, the United States does not support international law. We support the rules-based order that we designed in 1991, 92. How do we get back to the UN Charter, to those ideas, so that we can't ignore when our presidents and, and our leaders, and, and, and no one has mentioned Dick Cheney, but that's what I, I'm interested in all of your thoughts. We, this country used to be committed to international law. We used to tell the Soviets they had to comply with the charter that we drafted. And now, and after the end of the Cold War, we thought we were above it. It was supposed to be one lesson of Vietnam that we had played around with the law and we um, regretted it so deeply and we instituted the rule of law program for our military and that was forgotten with Clinton. So that would be my question. I, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on how we become a normal citizen of the world and, and demand of our, our own leaders the same conduct we're demanding of others. Okay, um, do people wanna speak to that? I, I can say just few words, maybe not necessarily answering the question. I think this is something for, for this country to figure out. Um, but I think, I think there is a sense that this is, this is always America is an exception. Hmm. Um, everything is an exception here. It's God's gift to the world, you know? And, and for many, many populations outside the world, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and, and so, so I, I, think, I think kind of fixing, fixing, fixing this country's political system and bringing people who are really worthy of being in these positions is probably the, maybe the, the easiest way to do it. Um, next question. I'm Ed Andreco. I'm a Franciscan, and I'm here with the McGrath Institute of Church Life as a visiting scholar. The question was raised, and quite pointedly and clearly, what about the voices of the institutions? And I know for a fact, a gentleman said to me that he carried a handwritten letter from then John Paul II to the White House, and he delivered it in person. The message was simple, don't do that. And then he mentioned to me a second letter shortly after, don't do it. So I said, and I wonder, the counterfactual, what if someone dared to listen. Can, can I address that? I, I think that's an electric comment, and it brings into this conversation something that we haven't mentioned before, which is that millions of people of conscience, not just in this country, but around the world, took to the streets to demonstrate right. against this war, to reject it, to argue that its foundations were corrupted, and to argue essentially for what Mary Ellen's point was, that the United States was straying so fundamentally from something so valuable that it will come to regret having destroyed it. Um, it is often, you know, Roy mentioned about this earlier, um, that you know, the Iraq war was popular, kind of. Um, it's true that polls generated a tremendous amount of support for that, but that's, I, I would argue, um, the result 
of 18 months of nonstop terror after watching 3,000 people die a horrible death as it unfolded. Um, it is remarkable to me in those circumstances that there were so many millions of people around the world, that there were leaders of conscience like, like Pope John Paul um, and uh, so many others that summoned the, the courage uh, and the integrity to oppose this. And fundamentally, I think, you know, as we would see um, later on as the years unfolded, how brittle that support domestically for the war was. Hi, I'm Pranav Kuntapalli. I'm an American student from India. And I was wondering, as someone who wasn't born when the US invaded Iraq, as someone who didn't live through the intellectual orthodoxy or the conventional wisdom of the time, how do we think critically about US involvement right now in Ukraine or upcoming involvement in the Pacific? There's, of course, no room for absolutes. but. U.S. asymmetric military support in Ukraine has brought strategic advantages. Ukraine has won on the battlefield, but the end game is dangerously unclear. How should we think in shades of gray? And I wonder what the virtues and vices are of journalistic work and historical work, and how can we think better? Well, I, I'm in the camp, which is a fairly small camp, I think, uh, that views the uh, Ukraine war as having been totally unnecessary, uh, that uh, had we listened to, I'm not a, def I don't defend Putin, but, but had we listened at least empathetically uh, with the arguments he made about the importance that Russia attached to Ukraine as de facto part of its sphere of influence, that some sort of agreement could have been reached that would have, could have prevented uh, the war. But I think that U.S. policy in the Ukraine war is, again, an example of uh, the, 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 the reluctance of elites to consider any functioning international paradigm other than one that assigns great privileges to the United States. I mean, this whole rules-based international order, I mean, one, one, could, one should always put that in quotes uh, because it is indeed simply a phrase intended to uh, justify a version of American primacy despite the uh, failures of U.S. policy, for example, Iraq. So that was a lousy answer, but that's the best that you're going to get at this time of night. I'll, I'll try just a little bit. Uh, it should guide U.S. policy in Ukraine that Ukraine could turn into Iraq. And the importance in U.S. policymaking of diplomacy to end conflicts is not a specialty you see practiced very much, very often anymore. Hmm. It's, it's extreme, it is in this conflict in particular, um, as Professor Basevich, I think, mentions, seen as kind of a mark of almost, you know, like moral cowardice to uh, attempt to end the war, um, to, you know, to, to push it toward some kind of end game, especially because an unpalatable end game available is to return to the February 24th, 2002 uh, status quo ante in Ukraine, in which Russia still has enormous influence over the Donbass and holds the Crimea outright. So it nevertheless has to be pointed to, like the experience of Iraq, if not even that, the experience of Syria, to point to how as bad as a war may look now, it can always get worse and can get worse in a hurry, and stalemate is not victory. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, I believe my uh, question would be, uh, first of all, addressed by Omar, and it addresses somewhat of uh, Mary Ellen's concerns, too. Uh, during uh, the, the Iraqi war, the United States used um, 2,750 tons 
of depleted ur uranium shells were exploded there, 250,000 tons. Now, the, this uranium has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. And Omar, you, you mentioned how the doctors are uh, see, seeing all kinds of infections and all kinds of things. The hospitals are overloaded. Well, of course, they're breathing in these alpha and gamma particles, and th this de depleted uranium has also um, sped in dust storms to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. So my question is, are, are the doctors and is Iraqi society aware of the gravity of having this depleted uranium, this uh, radioactive substance there, uh, 250 tons, half-life 450 billion years, and um, the babies are being born without brains, eyes, arms, one eye. I've seen the pictures you don't want to see. And the, late, the, the parents aren't asking, do they have 10, 10 fingers and 10 toes? They're asking, is it normal? Because they don't look like something, uh, it's, it's tragic. Right. So I want to know if, they're, uh, if they understand the gravity of what's there right now this second, and they're breathing in these particles that go down as, as far as 0.1 microns, uh, the size of a, of a virus. That's when it exploded. And one, one aside is that I think uh, Germany or U.S. is contemplating shipping these shells to Ukraine. Yeah, that's was the report this past week, and it's going to irradiate the the breadbasket of uh, Europe with uh, a 4.5 billion half life of radioactivity. All right. Thank you. Um, a very interesting question. The the the. I, I spent some time studying the science about uh, of depleted uranium, and and I work with uh, an organization called PAX, uh, or it's a it's a peace organization that is concerned with environmental cleanups and surveying. Um, the interesting thing about depleted uranium that the toxicity of it it's not necessarily the radioactivity. That's not the toxic part of depleted uranium. The toxic part of it is the chemical. Uh, it's a chemical toxicity. It's these kind of the dust, as you said, the, that remains that you can inhale. It create, creates a lot of problems. So, so that's kind of one uh, 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 issue around depleted uranium is that it's, it's not necessarily that radioactive uh, in terms of its uh, effect on health. But the chemical element is definitely is what, what affects that. Now, that being said, and it definitely has, has had a lot of effects in Iraq, Depleted uranium is just one thing out of a range of huge contaminants that has been thrown in that country. The, the burn pits, uh, the, the munition that has been used in the, uh, there, the heavy metals, the destruction of the, of the, of the infrastructure, the cement that, 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 is, that is kind of, you know, collapsing with all these, with these homes that is inhaled by people, these actually tens and, and, and hundreds of times more dangerous than the depleted uranium that was used in, in, in these wars. One of the really kind of interesting things about the Iraq war is that people kind of have found kind of this one cause and tried to kind of link a lot of things to it. But the biggest disaster of Iraq is that the US uh, did this war and there was no cleanup, no single cleanup uh, uh, that has been initiated after after the, 1990, the 1990s war or the 2003 war. And I think that, is, that will be probably one of the differences with the Ukraine. I, I mean, you know, inshallah, this war, the Ukraine war will, will be over, but you will see all companies, everyone will be there to clean up the mess or clean up these, these ornaments. In Iraq, no one did anything for that. So, so the, 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 uh, the, the things that you are talking about the, the congenital anomalies is what we call in, in kind of, uh, uh, what we call these are, epi I mean, what I would call a kind of this war biology, you know? These are epigenetics also. You know, people live through all kinds of stress, environmental, psychological, uh, social, um, and all of these elements are contributing to, to congenital anomalies, increases rates of cancer. Cancer is appearing in younger population that is never kind of seen before. Mm -hmm. a increase of, of these kind of non-healing wounds. But the bacteria, the ecosystem, the microbiome of people has changed. The food, you know, since 2003, Iraq stopped producing uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, produce. 
everything now is imported from outside and everything is cheap quality, drug, uh, fake drugs are going into the country. So it's a major, major mess that, that you know, that, that for me the depleted uranium is, is you know, it's, it's just one part of that story. So, so yes, it's, it's, it's an incredible, it kind of, it's an epitome of, of all, it's a kind of a, almost a, a metonym of all these different environmental uh, contaminants. But the story, the environmental problems in Iraq are much, much wider than this. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Hara, and I'm an undergraduate student. Um, I'm part Iraqi, so this is kind of hard to talk about. But my question is, how do you reckon a an unjust war and an illegal occupation with the fact that the Saddam Hussein regime uh, ethnically cleansed over 60,000 Kurds and uh, had hu numerous human rights violations in Iraq? For example, my own family suffered under the regime with many, many, many of our, like, very immediate close family members uh, killed and murdered in very horrendous ways under the regime for their ethnic background and their religious identity. So how do you reckon, I guess, pulling, I know earlier we talked about World War II, and how do you reckon that with the fact that you're, yes, like to, to people like my family, Saddam Hussein was the devil incarnate, he was our Hitler. I don't know if that is a shared opinion across Iraq, right? But how do you reckon that with the fact that Yes, this was an illegal occupation, but he was all of that. I also recognize it was a self-serving war for the U.S. to participate in, but as someone who was a victim, like the granddaughter and the daughter of the victims of uh, the atrocities that Saddam Hussein afflicted upon the country's minorities, I don't know how to, I guess, come to terms with that. I think it's, it's an excellent and enormously cogent point that we have to hold both of these things together simultaneously. Um, someone can be guilty, and what happens to them can still not be justice. I think, I think you're totally right. There is a big problem, and I think this is exactly part of the ambivalence that, that has, has been produced by this war, that many of us escaped Iraq because of Saddam, we left the country. I have, you know, half a dozen people in my family been executed by the regime. But now, and, and, and Saddam, by the time when I left Iraq in 98, was hated by every single person in that country. Now, he's a hero, thanks to that war. So, so whatever, that, that, that villain that we have kind of had in our, our lives uh, has, has now become a kind of a martyr. You know, he, he, he's celebrated as a martyr. People, you go in the Arab region, everyone talks about him as, as like kind of a hero who stood against the invaders, uh, as someone who has resisted. So, so, so yes, we, we all have wounds. We all have wounds from that. But I think that, that does not justify the destruction of the, of the entire country by a foreign, uh, a foreign uh, 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 military occupation to just to get rid of our own you know, to, to, to have that, this vengeance or this uh, uh, resolution uh, with, with, with Iraq. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I hear you very well. We all were ambivalent about, about the war because of the violence that this, this person has done to our families. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, just as a reminder, uh, the events for the Aftermath series continue tomorrow. Um, in this room at 8.30 a.m. is the interfaith discussion. Um, and then Aftermaths 2, The Invasion of Iraq in the Present, um, which is a series of literary readings, will also take place here tomorrow at noon. Um, after this event, we have a reception outside, so please continue the conversation. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, Royce Granton, Father John, um, Heather Aziala and all of our panelists today and all of our uh, audience and the questioners uh, for taking part in this discussion. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>